Thanks, Janice. Uh, yeah, I wish I was related somehow. That'd be great. Uh, so my name is Evan Kutter Manson. Uh, I'm a completion engineer uh, by title. I've been various engineering roles at Devon for the past nine years. More recently, I'm in a transition to a group uh, called Op Operations Technology, which for this conference is more similar to something like engineering technology. Um, so who is Devon Energy? Uh, we're an upstream oil and uh, independent oil and natural gas producer. Uh, we operate onshore North America, and we account for about a quarter million barrels of uh, oil produced per day. <clears throat> we have an active multi-billion dollar drilling program, um, and I think we operate somewhere around 8,000 wells, plus or minus. Uh, those wells are supported by hundreds and thousands of different assets and different pieces of equipment. So uh, from my perspective, at least from a traditional engineering perspective, uh, where our maturity is, at least at Devon Energy, and I think probably pretty generally in a lot of oil and gas, is that uh, we've kind of had this data analytics infusion over the past few years, maybe five years or so, uh, more formally. Uh, maybe people have been doing it for a lot longer, but we've actually had formal groups set up. And I kind of like this Gartner hype cycle. I'm sure some of you have seen this. Uh, it's a plot of expectations through time and the uh, initial innovation trigger. So that's, you know, we found, found out about machine learning, you know, in oil and gas. We're like, oh my gosh, everything's amazing. And it's gonna find all the sweet spots for oil and we're never gonna drill bad well. And we climb right up to the top of that peak of inflated expectations. You know, engineers and geologists are running around high-fiving each other in the hallway saying, yeah, we're never gonna drill bad well. And then, of course, it fails to deliver. Uh, we don't have enough data or something's wrong or we shot for the moon too much. And we slide down into that trough of disillusionment. And what I'm gonna present here is uh, that I believe that we've kind of sidestepped initially the, the much more concrete and real value proposition in just like the nuts and bolts of how we do things. So that's the, my, my take is the, uh, the surface operations. So we've been so focused on subsurface, the geology, all the super sexy stuff, and we've kind of just sidestepped all the uh, operations. So I think the way that we're actually gonna pull out and, uh, of this, into the slope of enlightenment into a plateau of productivity is taking a more tactical approach on machinery, equipment, surface operations, but still do some stuff in subsurface. That's still very important. So I'm a completion engineer, uh, so I, I'm kind of shamelessly stealing a lot of my colleagues' work. Uh, we, we set it on a team and uh, we have a whole team of people doing uh, more production facility equipment, more uh, standard stuff on the, op on the surface. This is just a small piece of what we do uh, as a company. So uh, we produce oil and gas and water, and that water we try to recycle as much as possible. We reuse it in different hydraulic fracturing jobs and anywhere we can. It's a very valuable commodity to us. But ultimately, uh, we need a way to handle the wastewater that we can't reuse. So this is a very simplistic uh, de depiction of a system. Uh, we have water coming in on this storage and settling facility. We have a lot of tanks that water comes in, things settle out, and then it goes into a filter. It filters try to get everything cleaned up before it goes into our, our very expensive high pressure injection pumps. Uh, they're electric driven, variable frequency drive pumps. And then we have a disposal well that ultimately uh, injects the wastewater down into a deep uh, um, zone. It's typically like a, an old oil zone that's depleted. So I'm just gonna kind of step through. Uh, fortunately, we've been, I've been very fortunate to come into a role where all the groundwork has been really laid for us, for me and my team. Uh, we have a lot of data in, in a pie historian, and we are using, what you're gonna see here is a, um, we're using Seek as, as an analysis tool on top of that Pi historian. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, the storage and settling uh, equipment, the top two squiggly blue lines are flow rate coming into the facility. Uh, that green line, the third one down, is the oil level in our, uh, like our slop tank, our, our gun barrel, the initial kind of flow in. 
So we produce a lot of oil, we produce a lot of gas and water. Uh, entrained in that water is very small amounts of very hard to separate oil. Uh, and also occasionally we get slugs of oil that come through for faulty equipment upstream, uh, valve hanging open, you know, et cetera. There's a whole myriad of reasons. But what I want to highlight is the bottom two uh, lines. So we basically qualify how much oil is coming into our system relative to the amount of water. And traditional engineering kind of says, okay, if we put a boundary on, on uh, your oil PPM, it needs to be around 100 or something, you know, I don't, something like that. And what's interesting about this is we quickly just dumped in the first derivative and got a rate of change of that line, right? So this red line, each of these spikes indicate a slug of oil. And what's important here is that this oil tank is a 750 barrel tank. So each foot in that tank is 20 to 30 barrels of oil. So if you can see the scale of this is zero to seven. So I mean, it's, you see these big step ups that are multiple feet. So not only are we not selling that oil, <laughs> because that's what we would like to do as an oil and gas company, uh, we're actually clogging things up downstream. That oil comes with, it's kind of a dirty, messy, unprocessed oil. Uh, so we would really very much like to know when that happens and maybe send out alerts to field personnel and say, hey, you got something going on. Moving down the line uh, to a filter, this is a little bit simpler of an example. Um, blue is flow rate through the filter, and red is the pressure drop across that filter. So if the red line goes up, that means the filter's clogging up and we need to replace it. The scale of this is about two months. So you can see, you know, in two months we've replaced quite a few filters, right? Each time that, that line resets, that's when a field personnel is actually physically changing out that sock filter. So we were kind of playing around with this actually back in September, and uh, we, we said, well, we can see an obvious trend here. You know, maybe we can predict this. So we threw just a simple kind of regression on it and predicted out, and then, you know, we all went and went home and all that, and then uh, back in, in October, I looked back at this analysis again and saw that, okay, this line we kind of projected out when it hits 10 PSI into the future. Uh, they ended up replacing it, it looks like right about here. So we were a few days off, but it was pretty good for, you know, a few minutes worth of just kind of real quick and dirty analysis, you know. So moving along, this is a little bit more complex. Um, so this is the injection pump. It's a variable frequency drive, so it's all over the place. It can operate in all sorts of conditions. Uh, and there's a lot of inputs, and uh, you can see it's all over the place. This, this line right here, this green line, is actually the, the amperage draw of that motor. And obviously, you know, I can't really see what's going on in this. There's a lot of other stuff and noise going on, and this is over the course of a couple, three months. But uh, working with Seek, uh, they've been very, uh, very nice with letting us kind of play with their new tool um, with this data. We said, hey, there's something important about amps. Maybe we you know, want to know something about that because we pay a lot of money in ele electricity and maybe we want to try and see something about that pump. So what this tool is doing, and I'll get into this a little bit later, what this tool is doing, uh, from my perspective at least, Brian probably has a a little bit more detail in this, is that it's going and finding very comparable conditions in the raw data um, and trying to find all sorts of different correlations and combinations in a multitude of dimensions and then pulls all that back down and reduces the dimensional, dimensionality back down to a two-dimensional plot that you know, an average engineer like myself can understand. So what you see, what's kind of interesting about this is this red line now is a representation of amperage when all things are comparable and this line is just gradually increasing. That's very interesting to me because that's a quarter million dollar pump that is apparently wearing out. And maybe that's a bearing that's starting to seize up, maybe there's something else in the system that's causing it to do more work for the same amount of voltage. And then here's another plot of uh, that same data just thrown into a scatter plot because I love scatter plots. And you see voltages on the y-axis, amps is on the x-axis, 
and the blue dots are early time, the orange dots are later time, relatively, and you can see the shift in the data. And you should have, if the scales, you should have a very proportional V equals IR, voltage equals current times resistance. So you should have a nice proportional relationship uh, so you can see that shift. So the, the last piece of this, of this system is the disposal well itself. You can kind of think about this thing like a, like a giant version of that filter, right? So you've got, there we go. You've got injection pressure in red, you've got injection rate in blue, and this black line is just a calculation of these. It's an injectivity index. It's barrels per day per PSI. So as that black line decreases, that's we're losing injection into the well because the well itself is clogging up with debris, maybe oil, some of that stuff that's passing through. Um, so what's important about this is these green bars I've in indicated here on this particular well, this is within six months, uh, these are remediations of this well. So we actually went and spent money to go clean out the well, to pump a treatment on it, to try and clean it up. And each one of these are, you know, roughly speaking, order of magnitude about 50, ten dollars to $50,000 every time we do it. So that's a lot of money. But what's more important is that we're an oil and gas company, and if this system shuts down, it backs up everything else, everything behind it, and we can't produce oil and gas because we can't safely handle our water. So we have to shut things down. So, you know, the ten dollars to $50,000 remediations pale in comparison to shutting down an entire field development, and that's a really quick way to get your executives to start calling your, your phone. So <laughs> don't let that happen. And of course, here's a, another scatter plot of the same data. Um, again, early time in blue, late time in orange, and we see flow rate on the bottom, tubing injection pressure on top. And you can see that over time, we transition from a relatively high rate at lower pressures to relatively lower rates at higher pressures. So it's bad, right? It costs us more energy and also gives us less optionality. So my whole point with this is each of these things is not very, not very sexy, not very interesting individually. But together, I believe this is very interesting because it's, you're seeing the storage and settling system. You've got some oil carryover happening. You've got a filter where some clogging is happening on the filter. You've got a pump or maybe a bearing's wearing out. You've got a disposal well that's also kind of clogging up for the same reasons. This together is like a, it's describing the health of the system as a function of a bunch of analysis of its parts. So I think that's very important, the context of everything together. Um, transitioning a little bit, this is a little bit more of an exploratory analysis. I think one of the guys in the other rooms has something way more in detail, I wish I could go see his, is uh, <laughs> we also have these, these uh, natural gas compressors. So we're taking gas, natural gas, and pressurizing it to either send it down a line to get sold or re-injecting into an oil well to increase the production of that oil well. So what's kind of interesting here is that this is a year's worth of data from one of our uh, three-stage reciprocating compressors. It's, uh, it's kind of like a complex car engine, right? There's a lot of stuff going on and, you know, where do you start? It's like, okay, well, I've got access to this new fancy tool. I would love to just point it at it and see what happens. So when we did that, we said, okay, I don't know, go find something. Um, it, we said, hey, suction pressure is important. It's not necessarily that we can necessarily control the suction pressure all that much, but it's important to operation of the compressor. So what this is showing is it's, it's taking in multiple input signals, raw input signals, and without any kind of analytical model being built, I'm not telling it anything about the compressor. I'm not telling it uh, how a compressor works. I'm just saying, hey, here's some signals that are related somehow. Run it through the tool and it pulls out, it goes and looks for all these comparable conditions and a lot more dimensions than I can even think of and reduces that back down to a two dimensional representation. And so, okay, you know, who cares? So what, you know, what's, what's going on here? Well, 
this is the, the suction pressure and it's saying, hey, over this course of time, the suction pressure is remaining pretty constant and then you have this obvious shift in operating condition. Something is happening that's deviated from normal, right? And it's happened very abruptly. So what is that? And if you go back to the data, you know, that point is right there. Just that little uptick in uh, suction pressure. So, you know, well, why didn't it pick this thing out? This, this other, you know, very similar uptick in pressure. Well, if you look at this, you know, if you think about suction pressure is the kind of like the inlet to your compressor. And the compressor does some work on that gas. So it has an RPM, which is this blue line. So if you think about it, if your compressor slows down, your suction pressure should kind of come up a little bit initially because you've got a gas flow going through it, the compressor slows down, it kind of backs up. And so you can kind of see, kind of reason out why, okay, this wasn't picked because, well, I had a corresponding drop in RPM. So that's kind of, that makes sense in the system. Um, but again, I didn't have to make a model to train, you know, the computer to know that relationship. So again, this is very exploratory and kind of just a, a neat kind of thing that we were kind of just messing with more recently. I would love to keep, keep pursuing this. This is a big issue for us. Um, so key takeaways. Um, first is the most obvious is I think personally, I think uh, incremental optimization of very concrete nuts and bolts type operations can have immense value uh, on upstream oil and gas and other industries as well which seems to be a common theme at ARC with all the processing equipment. Uh, so when I say that at scale, I mean lateral scale. So you've got pump one, pump two, pump three. We have hundreds to thousands of those pumps. So it'd be great to be able to optimize them together. But also the vertical scale of a connected system. So that pump is also part of a system that has a health, you know, tanks to filters, to pumps, to wells. And we have hundreds of those as well. Uh, and kind of taking a step back and looking at the process a little bit more holistically, I really firmly believe that the anal analytical tools uh, and all these fancy uh, techniques that everybody's developing is very, very powerful in the hands of the, the operators, the people working on the equipment, the engineers overseeing the equipment, the operational teams that are actually, you know, have the contextual knowledge of that system. Um, and so that, that contextual knowledge and that first principle knowledge really provides some sort of guiding direction on uh, or a reality check on uh, runaway correlations. You know, stuff like uh, in July, ice cream sales are high and also drowning you know, deaths are very high in July. So therefore, ice cream causes drowning. You know, that's, there's some context outside of that is that uh, would beg to differ. So that and then... Um, it also provides much more fruitful exploratory analysis, insights. Uh, it triggers a lot of other things as you're, you get an operator and their eyes just kind of light up and they say, oh, well, well, if you look at this and do this and do this, and then it just snowballs into other things, you know, it's, it's crazy. And then also this piece, I've experienced this quite a bit, is it slashes down the iteration cycles of working on an analysis, working on implementation, instead of saying, hey, group, XYZ over here, you know, here's all this data and they get back to me in a couple weeks and they can say, here it is. I'm like, well, this isn't quite right. You know, I don't know, maybe this, where that can kind of happen rapidly in within minutes, just sitting there cycling through, you say, oh, well that, oh, that's garbage. I'm gonna go to this, oh, try this, you know. So I just really, uh, I really believe that the, the people the doing the work can really be empowered with, uh, with this kind of tools and technology. Thank you.